uh, posting people in charge of uh, gross income international and all the activities that it took to make that money and collect it was very money motivated. And so while I was in Scientology, this always uh, ate away at my conscience, being part of a group that called itself a religion while I was seeing it function as a business. And that had a lot to do with, you know, why I actually escaped the first time in 1990 and again in 1993. And then it finally took me eight years to get out. But I think that that answers one of your other questions is that once a member is recruited, um, you've become subject to the effective persuasion, the persuasion of the group that uses deception to persuade you. And well, some people could say, well, how could you become, how could you fall for that? Well, I, I've spoken in a lot of groups where, a lot of Christian groups where people have come up to me and said, how could you have fallen for a, a persuasive message like that? And I ask the question, well, have you ever been deceived? Ever? Well, that's what it is. It's deception, you know, at a big, very effective scale. Craig, you had a question. Yeah, um, and, you know, you, you said about your friend that sort of got you into this. Uh, and, and was it that just he uh, joined, or had he gone through an arc? He had just joined Scientology. He had just joined Scientology. Yeah. And you said his, his behavior changed, you know. Mm -hmm. um, well, what, what was that? I mean, I, and, and let me just add one thing. I mean, I remember years ago I read this book, uh, Snapping, I think it was called, you know, you may be familiar with it. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. considered uh, <coughs> psychology, yeah. I think so. uh, current, you know, it may be debunked, but, uh, but it had to do with people's, some techniques that sort of dramatically change people's personalities. And I remember that people, uh, you said he didn't make sense you know so Thing, things he said didn't make sense um, when we were friends he was someone who was very helpful to his friends always had time for his friends um, he thought rationally and by that he could take he could put two and two together in something you were saying rather than focus on each individual statement um, <coughs> And he was sort of depressed because his father had had him in a business that he failed at, basically. Um, and so he got the book Dianetics, Modern Science of Mental Health and read it. And, you know, there's question of whether it sounds like hocus pocus to people or whether it sounds truthful to people. Different people see it different ways. but. When he read that, he found out that there was a, an org, they call them orgs, just yeah. basically an office here, um, and went there. And soon after he started going there and becoming associated, taking classes and stuff, he quit having time for his friends, his family. He started spending all his time at the org. I mean, and I'm talking like 9 in the morning to 11 at night you know, not, not having any time for anything. And then, you know, he would tell me that they had all the answers to all the problems in the world. And yet he told me that he was going to join staff so he could get his courses for free. And I asked him, if you have all the answers to all the, questions, the problems in the world, I would think that you would want to give it away. And he told me that they don't give it away because people don't appreciate things that are given to them. They only appreciate it if they have to pay. And that just seemed kind of illogical because, you know, some of the best things in life are free. And I believe that's true. <laughs> that's, actually that's actually straight out of L. Ron Hubbard policy. You remember. I think that I'm not being hassled, even though I speak into media, because other people who have come out of the church who work directly under David Miscavige are now speaking in the media who pose a far greater threat than I do at this moment because they work directly with him and can reveal things, you know, through their experiences that are more current and are more probably imminently dangerous. You're not the biggest threat. So I'm not the biggest threat. So that takes pressure off me. Although when I first got out, um, 
I was, I went through so many different harassing situations, including um, I got my first book contract on my story in 2000 with Bronwyn Holman Publishers, and uh, the legal officials caught wind of my book coming out, and they, they threatened Bronwyn and Holman with a lawsuit if they published my book. So that was the end of that book. Um, the publisher didn't want to withstand a lawsuit. And the same happened again in, 19, in 2006. So, you know, they've stopped, successfully stopped both of those books from coming out. Um, and lots of stuff happened in between that. So, but that's all going to be covered in my book as well. When does that come out? We're working on that right now. Okay. <laughs> as soon as possible, I hope. Were there any other questions? Do you have a couple days? <laughs> 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 yeah, I'd like to see a, you know, a topic on um, sociology, you know, within this network on, you know, the topics relating to, um, you know, I've talked about cults, communities, and concerns. I consider it of enormous concern. And I think the issue that we talked about today, what do you call these groups? It, it's such a stumbling block, and it, it keeps discussions from even happening. Mm -hmm. I agree with people that. Are, people are afraid to call a group that brings harm. People are afraid to call it a cult because it may be offensive to certain uh, cultural groups, to certain academic groups, but what about the harm that the group is causing and has caused? Isn't that a greater need that necessitates these discussions? That's my point of view. So the discussion may never happen because people are worried about it. People yeah. are dis cult. discussing right. whether it's I mean, a cult, huge. whether it's a religion, <laughs> So mm -hmm. they never discuss what's wrong with it. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, people die and are, are deceived or are entrapped. Uh, you know, I, I didn't get anywhere close to, well, I didn't talk about any of my personal issues, but for instance, I told you that I was in the entertainment business. My, my husband at that time, Peter Schloss, is still behind the fences of the Scientology management group outside of Los Angeles as of today and I left 12 years ago and this was a you know fabulously talented composer who you know whose song was performed at the Grammys had a fabulously potential successful career and got lured into this and is still there mm -hmm. and you can't call and talk to him anymore no it's we're absolutely you know we haven't talked in 12 years and we were together for 21 so there's that you know the disconnection issue that people who are coming out of Scientology now that you see on CNN and things like that they're talking about the specifics of being made to disconnect from family members well that's what happened to me David Miscavige personally engineered my husband's disconnection from me when I chose not to remain in. Um, I've got that personal story. There's hundreds of those stories to be told. I have that story too. My friend won't. He sent me a letter that he couldn't talk to me if I was going to say anything wrong with Scientology.